and, and uh, she has a keen interest in obstetric anesthesia. So could you please start your lecture on labor analgesia? A very important topic. Well, I'm Dr. Swati, MD Anesthesiology from PGIMR Chandigarh. I'm currently I'm working as additional professor in Indira Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, Patna. So I'll talk about labor analgesia. Now why this is an important topic? Labor pain is considered as one of the most intense pain felt by human. But the experience of labor pain, uh, it depends upon its subjective and it is multifaceted. What is why it is so complex? The complexity of labor pain is due to complex interaction of many factors like parity, like your uh, physiological factors, psychoeducation, uh, the education level of the patient, then ethnicity, race, it depends upon a lot of things. So every woman's experience of labor pain is unique. So we have to customize the labor analgesia according to the patient. It was rightly said by Moir that what is the goal of labor analgesia? The goal is that delivery of an infant in the arm of conscious and pain-free mother is one of the most exciting and rewarding moment of medicine. It is so difficult to quantify the labor pain. Because as I told you, it is subjective. It varies from person to person, female to female, depends upon so many factors. But a landmark study published by Mislak and colleague, uh, where they quantified the labor pain on the basis of Magill questionnaire. And what this, uh, let's say, reported, what was published, that pain rating index of labor pain was 10 to 20 points above the pain due to amputation, the pain felt due to phantom limb, or even more than cancer pain. So you can understand the intensity of the labor pain. That is why the quest of the requirement of a proper labor analgesia is from ages. And the history dates right back with the advent of anesthesia. Well, first time for labor, uh, ether was used by, doc, uh, by your James Young Simpson. Then after few years, chloroform was used. Then something very popular thing came, twilight sleep, which had few drugs and hypnosis. And then came the real, uh, let's say, good measure, um, uh, good uh, uh, modalities of pain removal in labor with advent of and development of regional anesthesia. For, from 1900 to 1930, spinal, epidural, blocks, all were used for labor analgesia. And today, the gold standard is considered as epidural and its modifications. Uh, you know, uh, when this labor pain uh, analgesia was started, uh, it was started centuries before. Uh, the woman who opted for labor analgesia or who demanded or who wanted labor analgesia, they were looked down upon. Now, is it just to we have to remove the labor pain because it is very unpleasant and poorly tolerated? No, it's not because of its just unpleasantness and intensity that we have to reduce or we have to uh, remove the labor pain. It is because of the deleterious effect of the labor pain on both fetus and the mother. Due to cascade of events due to labor pain, leading to sympathetic stimulation, <clears throat> your hyperventilation, etc. All this would turn up into fetal hypoxia, fetal acidosis. Plus, intense labor pain can also cause uh, the damage or let's say some amount of uh, problems in the birth canal of the female also leading to trauma and a very poor experience by the by mother so it is not only uh, we have to remove the labor pain because of its uh, unpleasantness right or intensity because it is deleterious uh, saying all these things i would like to uh, on a, like, i would like to salute this lady she is Queen Victoria. She was one of the pioneer who opted for labor analgesia against the wishes of the physicians and the doctors of that time and said it was one of the most wonderful appearance, uh, one of the most wonderful experience. So Queen Victoria, during birth of Prince Leopold, took chloroform for labor analgesia 
and again took it for her next childbirth also right so little bit acceptance came with queen victoria saying all these things my talk will revolve around following points i would talk about pain pathways during labor and vaginal delivery techniques of labor analgesia pharmacological non pharmacological myths and controversies drugs and adjuvants and how to practice labor analgesia what is the protocol what protocol we should follow and what we follow at our institute and scope of further research on this topic so what is the pain pathway and why it is necessary to know see the labor pain varies uh, we have different stages of labor and labor pain varies uh, the the let's say the uh, pathway of the pain varies in every phase of the labor and during delivery so we have to know about these pathway to offer a good pain relief couched according to the patient and according to what stage of labor we are taking the patient so labor pain has both visceral and somatic component during first phase of labor due to contraction of uterus and dilatation of cervix a visceral pain is felt by the patient and this is transmitted through the c fibers and a a delta fibers and it is uh, transmitted to t 10 to l1 part of the spinal cord okay and when the patient goes into the second phase the pain is due to pressure of the fetal head on the pelvic floor and the stretching of the perineum so it is mainly mainly the somatic pain which is transmitted through s1 s2 s3 of the pudendal nerve and not only this the spinal component of the labor pain they we have supra spinal component as well ascending and descending fibers going to pons medulla uh, your thalamus and also going to the cortex with extension to cortex limbic cortex so we have a uh, well, let's say emotional response to the labor pain as well the emotional response so emotional component cannot be ruled out of the labor pain because emotional component cannot be ruled out so non pharmacological techniques definitely have some role so depending upon the patient is in which stage of labor we have to couture our labor analgesia accordingly saying this what are the ways of giving labor analgesia well it can be divided into pharmacological and non pharmacological technique non pharmacological technique i will just touch what are in non i mean as i told you labor analgesia the requirement is from centuries because the pain is very intense there are various method like acupuncture hydrotherapy water injection relaxation biofeedback massage tens antenatal education birth training counseling all have been studied for ameliorating the labor pain now there is in 2012 there was a cochrane systematic analysis published which evaluated all the different modes of non pharmacological technique and they came up that what may work and what has insufficient evidence um, and what techniques have insufficient evidence so what we may work according to this uh, large database cochrane analysis uh, water immersion water immersion relaxation technique acupuncture and massage has some role in ameliorating the labor pain but hypnosis biofeedback sterile water injection tens they have no role aromatherapy they have no role i mean they don't have sufficient evidence to uh, substantiate their role in labor analgesia then coming on the pharmacological techniques pharmacological techniques again can be divided into two regional and systemic techniques in regional we have epidural and its modification spinal the single shot and continuous and the blocks different blocks like prenatal prenatal block pudendal block as the fetus descend and these are mostly given by the obstetricians what we are doing we are mostly going for epi the epidural and its modification and spinal if we are opting for that and we'll talk about it but before coming on these gold standard the epidural and its modification i'll talk about systemic technique now coming on the systemic techniques again it can be divided into inhalational and uh, iv 
In relational, two important gases have a role, a older one, entonox, and the newer one, CVOX. And in IV, mostly it's opioids, the role of opioids. So first, let us talk about inhalational. <clears throat> so from 1880, Indonox was introduced for labor analgesia. It's a 50% nitrous oxide in oxygen. What is the benefit? We all know that nitrous oxide has analgesic property. So the analgesic property of nitrous oxide was utilized in this endonox for labor analgesia. The second benefit is that it can be self-administered. When the pain comes, the female can take internox and little bit pain relief, little become unconscious. And again, when the pain goes again, she becomes conscious. The problem is that it was not offering a very good pain relief but lot of and it was causing a lot of atmospheric and surrounding pollution because of the gases getting going out into the atmosphere. Plus, post uh, consciousness after internox, the patient was very much nauseous and drowsy also, and very much nauseous. Nausea was a major issue. So, the females they were not liking it, and. 69% the studies report the 69% of the women getting endonox for labor analgesia <laughs> required or demanded other technique in the later stage of the labor and but saying this saying this that endonox cannot be used as a complete therapy I would not totally negate its role the latest data from United States says that the use of endonox is has increased recently in the United States as an alternative to epidural, the gold standard. So yes, they are going for, they are again coming to back square and internox role is cannot be uh, totally negated. So a lot of patients where we cannot go for gold standard or who don't opt for gold standard, it is one of the technique which we can practice along with other technique. So internox had a problem. <coughs> so internox was, if we had another inhalation like CVOX, a sub anesthetic dose of sevoflurane in oxygen. Now, it sevoflurane doesn't have analgesic effect. Then, how does it we use it in labor analgesia? Because it produces a quick unconsciousness and quick consciousness. So, the labor pain goes away and the patient becomes conscious again. So, does it offer analgesia? Just make the person unconscious and unaware of the pain, right? The benefit is it is much less nauseating than nitrous oxide. So the acceptance was much better. Studies have shown like a landmark study published in British Journal of Anesthesia, right? They said in 2007, they said that CVOX is definitely better than Antinox in term of patient satisfaction and acceptance. Uh, and definitely even the realize I mean, I mean even the option for uh, other analgesic method was less with C when CVOX was being used. Okay, so these are two inhalational techniques. Coming on the IV, mostly opioids and long run pethidine ruled the lab for labor analgesia. I am pethidine rule labor analgesia. I would just touch there are they we have used a lot of things actually a lot of opioids has been used but I would just touch the two main one pethidine the oldest and one of the most commonest and remifentanil the latest and best so what is pethidine why pethidine now pethidine what is the problem with pethidine the best thing about pethidine it was given IM so it could be uh, given even by the gynecal adjust obstetricians uh, but the pain control was ineffective. There was a placental transfer. There was a uh, there was uh, like reports of uh, respiratory depression in the female. Plus, uh, the problem was that it had if you give it for repeated dosing and for long duration, an uh, active metabolite norpethidine, which was neuroexcitatory, uh, would be produced. So it had a lot of problem. But it was most popular. Now. Why not replace it by a better one like remifentanil? What is the benefit of remifentanil? Now, remifentanil is a opioid which is ultra short acting. The half life is hardly three minutes. Dosing is very easy. It's given IV, of course, 
It is given in a bolus dose of 0.2 microgram per kg per minute to 1 microgram per kg per minute with a lockout interval of 1 to 5 minutes. It can be given through patient-controlled anal uh, patient analgesic pumps and the metabolites can be metabolized in, demifentanyl can be metabolized in even in fetus because it doesn't require liver and kidney for its metabolism. It requires just uh, plasma esterase, esterase, non-specific esterase, which is released by RBC, WBC. So it can be metabolized even in fetus. So it had no much, not much effect on the fetus also, respiration of the fetus also. This was a benefit of remifentanyl. Now, <clears throat> There was a double blind study which was published which compared the IV remifentanil with patient controlled remifentanil with intramuscular pethidine for liver analgesia and what they found that requirement of rescue analgesia was much less with remifentanil right and there was no sedation or oxygen desaturation in both the groups, right? So remifentanil, though it was, it's a higher opioid, it was also not causing any respiratory depression in the female and in the child and the APGAR score was fine in both the group. But the patient satisfaction was much, much better with remifentanil. Pain control was much better and requirement of rescue analgies are required with remifentanil. Then, <coughs> uh, saying this, a landmark study published in Lancet in your <coughs> this in this landmark study right published in lancet what they found this was called remi respite study that is use of iv remifentanil right this was published in 2018 2018 iv remifentanil versus intramuscular pethidine for pain relief in liver this was a popular respite study and they again uh, let's say justified the use of remifentanil over pethidine and they said that in this study they said that remifentanil should replace pethidine. Pethidine is more of a choice of obstetrician and it should be replaced by a better opioid. We have a better opioid available. So remifentanil halved the requirement of epidural conversion. Remifentanil <coughs> the rescue analgesia requirement was less and with remifentanil there was no respiratory depression to mother or fetus. So every benefit was seen with remifentanil. So they recommended the replacement and the very next year in International Journal of Obstetrics they published a Remy PCA safe study how to give remifentanil in labor analgesia. So they came up with the recommendation how to use remifentanil in labor analgesia. So a very simple way was formulated and this study was based on pooled 10,000 patients, right? So it was a big study actually, more than 10,000 I would say. In this study they said that while you are giving remifentanil, what they recommended, don't, you don't require to use a basal infusion. The dose is 40 microgram bolus with a two minute of lockout period. Only 40 microgram bolus every two minutes we can give, right? So we can give it by a patient control infusion pump and you don't require any basal infusion. Better than nitrous oxide, <coughs> better than uh, your, uh, let's say, uh, the inhalational techniques, but the study showed that compared to neuraxial techniques, the gold standard, it was in, still inferior. The only problem was little bit more sedation was seen in the mother, but it was safe for fetus. So let us now talk about the comparing, till now, the comparison of the different technique. So we talked about non-pharmacological technique, which is the least efficient in for labor analgesia. Then your nitrous oxide, the inhalational CVOX or nitrous oxide. <coughs> then your opioids. In opioids, the best is remifentanil through a patient control analgesia. And above all, the best one is what we are going to discuss now. That is epidural. That is epidural lens modification. So still the gold standard is epidural and its modification. So let us talk about the neuraxial technique. In neuraxial technique, <laughs> three important things we have to discuss. The analgesis, the technique, what are the different techniques which we are using, there are a lot of modification which we are using. What is the timing for choosing the neuraxial technique and is the technique safe in a patient with the previous LSCS going for a normal delivery? Well, let us talk about first the timing. It is one of the most controversial thing of labor analgesia. What is the right time to put epidural? <clears throat> now, a lot of studies have, have been done on this, that early or late, 
uh, late uh, or let's say late uh, uh, securement of neuraxial or late starting of the epidural technique depending upon some arbitrary cervical dilatation no the american society of obstetrician and gynecologist and american society of anesthesiologists they jointly passed a memorandum and they said that timing for neuraxial technique should be when the female demands when she starts having pain or even before that you can secure it it should not depend upon some arbitrary cervical dilatation 4 cm 5 cm nothing of that sort it can be just put when the female demands now the next important thing is <coughs> that lot of studies have done and it has shown no difference in operative conversion or let's say uh, forceps application with early or late uh, late attachment of the epidural late uh, so it should be individualized number of time it should be individualized on the on the on the basis of the every patient if a patient is demanding in the early phase of the labor definitely that is an indication of putting the epidural catheter securing a number of difficult cases like what we do we go for epidural catheter placement even before she goes in patient goes into labor just in case she will not give me a good position when she is in labor okay okay <clears throat> then whether we can use this technique for analgesia in a patient with a prior cs or not yes today it is recommended if a patient had a prior lscs due to any reason if the obstetrician wants to go for normal delivery for the next time labor analgesia through neuraxial technique is best suited so it can be used in a patient with previous ls cs it's appropriate to place it early right so in case if a operative del it is converted into operative delivery the operative like ls cs we can use the same technique we can use the same we can just use the same technique and just change the concentration of the drug so it can be used for analgesia and later on if required it can be used both for anesthesia also okay now coming on different analgesic techniques <clears throat> the conventional one lumbar epidural analgesia this is the conventional one this lumbar epidural analgesia in this initially a uh, catheter epidural catheter is placed and we go for a bolus and then a continuous infusion or intermittent bolus technique we'll talk about now lot of modification has been done over this technique <clears throat> the next is the variant combined spinal epidural the combined spinal epidural has taken the benefit of both spinal and epidural and definitely it has some complication but it has some indications also in some in in some females i'll talk about it then <clears throat> single shot spinal analgesia this also has role in some centers where uh, they don't have like uh, uh, expertise to manage the epidural catheter for the labor analgesia and patient has come into late stage i'll talk about it <clears throat> then dural puncture epidural technique this is a new technique dural puncture epidural technique what it is i'll just talk about it and <clears throat> continuous spinal analgesia so these are the different techniques what i talked about is first was your lumbar epidural then combined spinal epidural then single shot spinal analgesia then dural punctured epidural and continuous spinal analgesia leaving conti continuous spinal analgesia all the other techniques we practice at our center also and they have good results even clinically and uh, let's say different studies recommends their use in different condition so let us compare these methods their advantages and disadvantage so epidural epidural is a conventional technique people are the conventional epidural continuous epidural technique is people are more familiar with this technique and it's being used from ages so still and lot of centers they are only practicing this conventional epidural continuous epidural analgesia and <clears throat> the disadvantage that if a patient is in active labor then the timing to reach for analgesia that it takes longer time to get good analgesia to the patient right so that is one of the main disadvantage that onset time is less right uh, onset time is uh, uh, let like slow onset time for analgesia is slow so this can be superseded by combined spinal epidural if a patient is in active labor 
we can go for a low dose spinal and put a catheter for a maintenance of the of the analgesia so it is giving us the benefit of both spinal and epidural so in a patient in the later stage of the labor with good pain cse would be preferred over the plain epidural technique the only issue is the cse can be associated with some of the complications of spinal like headache like uh, hemodynamic imbalance so you have to be little bit careful plus it may have little bit sometimes because of hypotension and all fetal implications as well right because of hypotension component then <coughs> uh, dural puncture epidural technique well this in this technique a very thin 26 27 gauge vitreal needle is taken and epidural this uh, subarachnoid uh, space is entered i mean you do a uh, Uh, you insert it through the arachnoid matter and go in subarachnoid space as you do for CSE, but you don't give drug, right? You simply pierce that that space, but you don't give drug. You after piercing that space, you put an epidural catheter in the epidural space, but because you have pierced the subarachnoid space, you have reached through your needle, you have reached subarachnoid space. you have created a conduit between epidural and subarachnoid space so slowly drug may diffuse into subarachnoid space so again it was giving us few benefit of uh, spinal without giving us the complications of spinal because it was slow slowly it was diffusing into the subarachnoid space so this dural puncture epidural technique is nowadays becoming quite popular and i will just tell you about a landmark study which compared csc dural puncture dural epidural technique plus conventional epidural technique now let's talk about spinal <coughs> spinal only single shot spinal well if a patient has come into very late let's demanded labor in analgesia in very late stage she we believe that she will deliver in 4 hours plus the center does not have good facility for monitoring and all then we can go for a single shot spinal a very small uh, let's say 2.5 mg of uh, bupivacaine is given along with your uh, 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 let's say 50 to 100 microgram of uh, your uh, uh, fentanyl and 250 microgram of morphine right so 2.5 mg of uh, bupivacaine 50 to 100 microgram of fentanyl and 250 microgram of morphine is given together it gives a very good analgesia lasting for 4 hours it can be repeated as well if delivery doesn't happen in 4 hours so it is used for only when patient comes in a very late stage of the labor and we expect delivery to happen fast okay <clears throat> so i talked about a landmark study which compared epidural conventional dural puncture epidural and combined spinal epidural what was the result of this study that the onset time was faster onset of analgesia was faster in combined spinal epidural right faster than dural puncture which combined csc had 2 minutes of onset dural puncture epidural showed 11 11 minutes of onset of analgesia and conventional epidural 18 minutes but the requirement of top ups was least in dural puncture epidural because of slow diffusion of the drug from epidural to spinal space so only 22.5% patient required the top ups in dural puncture epidural technique compared to 50% in both csc and conventional epidural technique so this is a good technique which can be used now <coughs> for maintenance there are various way of maintaining the analgesia the conventional 21 the continuous infusion into epidural space baseline continuous infusion or intermittent top ups at regular interval these are two let's say uh, the older method of maintenance not practiced nowadays nowadays more it is a uh, baseline infusion with a patient control patient control analgesia right patient control analgesia so patient control epidural analgesia with a basal infusion is more practiced now and american society of obstetrician and gynecologist and asa american society of anesthesiologists jointly recommend this technique for maintenance but above this technique this technique the patient control epidural analgesia with a basal infusion i would like to talk about two more novel techniques one is programmed intermittent epidural bolus or automated mandatory epidural bolus what is this in this instead of a the baseline infusion continuous baseline infusion 
the device is programmed to give intermittent boluses at a particular intervals. And studies have shown that this provides a better analgesia over a continuous infusion technique. Right. Plus, I will talk about the studies in a second. Plus, there is another technique which is computer integrated patient control epidural analgesia. In this, a computerized device is attached with the infusion pump. And depending upon the last hour requirement of the patient, the basal infusion rate can be altered. So the patient satisfaction was much better with this technique. So these two are new novel techniques giving much better results in different case studies reported. So <coughs> a very, let's say, um, a, a study published in, uh, let's say, nine, 2019, what this study, this study compared the programmed intermittent bolus and continuous infusion as the background infusion for patient control epidural analgesia, either a continuous baseline infusion or a programmed intermittent bolus. What does they said? That the patient every time the it recommends that patient control epidural analgesia is always better for patient satisfaction. But instead of baseline infusion, go for intermittent boluses. Why go for intermittent boluses? Because automated bolus has a higher satisfaction because what happens a good amount of drug under pressure is delivered to the epidural space so diffusion of the drug over the larger space is good and patient analgesia is better so we get a intense better analgesia rather than a slow baseline infusion so when a bolus was coming with a pressure it was providing more analgesia so again uh, to 2012 2012 uh, another study which compared the automated mandatory bolus with a baseline infusion for patient control epidural analgesia and found that breakthrough pain was much less with automated bolus group. The total consumption of uh, local anesthetic was much less with automated bolus group. Patient satisfaction was much better with automated bolus group and there was no difference in maternal side effects or neonatal or obstetrician outcomes. So this gives a better patient control analgesia if we supplement automated boluses with a patient control analgesia. Okay. Then as I talked about computer integrated patient control epidural analgesia, a computerized device is attached as you can see with this uh, uh, infusion pump and depending upon the last hour requirement, the baseline infusion can be altered. So again, it will give a better patient control, patient satisfaction. Okay. <clears throat> so device just adjust the background infusion rate according to the frequency of the earlier demands. Okay. So what are the things we have to monitor during uh, labor analgesia? We have to uh, monitor the hemodynamics. Our IV line has to be secured. Maybe a saline little bit has to be started. And when the female feels the uncomfortable contractions, then epidural is given. So what do we aim for? The dose can be repeated. What do we aim for? We aim for a walking epidural. We aim for a happy, pain-free patient, but the motor power intact, so happy, happy, let's say walking, we call it walking epidural. This is what we aim for. Now, <clears throat> what are the drugs we can use? Three important local anesthetics are used. Bupivacaine, Wopivacaine, and Levobupivacaine. Now, epidural for epidural analgesia and for spinal, these are the concentration which is recommended, right? For epidural, we need to give as low concentration as possible and this has been made only possible with an adjuvant of opioids. Opioids added is always recommended because it will decrease the concentration of the local anesthetic and it will prevent any motor blockage in them, right? So always remember to add opioids with your local anesthetic for labor analgesia. This will decrease the requirement and the concentration of the local anesthetic and it will make the walking epidural possible. So as low concentration as possible, what is recommended is from 0.06 to 5% to 0.125%, okay, for bupivacaine. And as you can see, it is written for opium and levobupivacaine also. What are the adjuvants? As I talked, opioids is being used from age old and has given ex excellent result. But the problem with opioid is it can cause fetal respiratory depression. Most Mostly lipophilic opioids are used, fentanyl and its adjuvants. So, <coughs> other oh, uh, adjuvants are also studied like clonidine, dexmedetomidine, neostigmine, some showing good results. 
especially the alpha 2 agonists like clonidine and dexmedetomidine. Now, <clears throat> let us talk about some of the myths and controversies of liver analgesia. First, as I already told, first myth, early epidural initiation when cervical dilatation is less than 4 cm would increase the rate of instrumental delivery and C-section. Absolutely, it has been abundant by different studies. They say there is no difference in early or late initiation of the epidural on instrumental delivery and C-section. Now, I have written some landmark, given the references of some landmark study of New England Journal 2005, uh, Cochrane Database Systemic Review published in 2014, all have established the fact that early initiation would not cause any problem, rather it is better than the late initiation for the patient control for the good analgesia and a better epidural catheter placement. Then the second myth that we should discontinue the epidural in the late phase of labor to prevent any complications. Again a myth. There is no I mean, it should not be, female should not be denied for anal, uh, of, of analgesia in the later stage of labor when she is feeling more pain. Rather, it would help in a normal delivery to being pursued. So there is no, let's say, uh, support for this fact that we should discontinue the local anesthetic in the later stage of labor. So I have given the reference of a Cochrane Data Systemic Review published in 20, 2004. And they said... <coughs> that discontinuation of the epidural in the late stage of the labor has no benefit or benefit right whether you are discontinuing or continuing it has no effect on the adverse it has no and not there is no difference in the adverse effect right so there is no requirement of discontinuation of epidural in the later stage of the labor then <coughs> effect of neuroxyl analgesia on breastfeeding again it has been negated no role. Neuroxyl analgesia has no negative or adverse outcome on the breastfeeding. Different studies have substantiated this view. If there is a problem in breastfeeding, there could be due to some other reason. Okay. <clears throat> then there is no uh, different studies have uh, again uh, bro, uh, has uh, uh, let's say uh, removed this myth that patient whom epidural we are putting, they are complaining they are having long term backache or disability or movement restriction. No, after pregnancy because of the ligamentum, ligament laxation, backache etc. can happen. But epidural does not have any contribution in this, right? So there is no correlation between epidural or spinal with a backache etc. after the, in a, in a, in a parturient, after the delivery, got it? So no correlation. Then there is one gray area, association of maternal fever with epidural. Now, 80, I would say like 70 to 60 to 70 percent of the patient post epidural analgesia, they have like they complain or they, they have the fever, right? They have fever. Uh, exact mechanism and the cause is not known. This is called, this is what is the reason for this maternal fever with epidural analgesia? The most probably it is local anesthetic which causes sterile inflammation and activation of inflammasome, right? And exact cause still not established, but one third of the patient has shown association of fever, maternal fever, post epidural analgesia. So this is a gray area requiring more research, but it is innocent, not Rarely or I mean, I'm yet to find a case report or a study saying that this has led to sepsis or any mortality in the female. Okay, <clears throat> the post epidural analgesia. Then another important thing I want to add before telling the condu of, of labor analgesia that routinely we are using routine normal pain scale for even for monitoring the pain of, of labor pain. But labor pain is different from the other post-op pain and other pains. So for labor pain, we need a special scale. One special scale, an angle labor pain questionnaire scale. 
is exclusively designed for measuring the pain during labor and it has also been validated as a pain measurement scale post epidural analgesia and one more uh, let's say a questionnaire i want to just mention that is labor pain relief attitude questionnaire for pregnant women this is not a pain scale measuring tool but it is a questionnaire which tell us whether the pay, what is the attitude of patient towards the labor analgesia that which group of patient will opt for labor analgesia this questionnaire will give us give us an idea so maybe post if i get a get an idea from this questionnaire i can plan labor analgesia in the required patient some patient may require some patient may not require again i'm telling you it is it varies from patient to patient it varies from parity it varies on lot of things so this is different from other pain and patient has to demand for labor analgesia then only we give it okay so labor pain relief attitude questionnaire would help us in determining that what patient would require labor analgesia so just telling about the angel uh, labor pain questionnaire it's a new condition specific multi dimensional psychometric instrument that measure most important dimension of women's childbirth pain experience using five sub scale enormity of the pain fear and anxiety associated with pain uterine contraction pain burning pain and back pain this is the questionnaire right <coughs> which we can use and validate on our indian population as well then <coughs> this is what i was talking about the questionnaire which we use to measure the labor pain relief attitude questionnaire which we use to detect whether the patient would go for a labor analgesia can opt for labor analgesia or not what is her attitude for labor analgesia so these two are new pay new uh, like say scoring system adopted in the pay in parturients now conduit of labor analgesia how do we give labor analgesia <clears throat> there is a american society asa practice guideline and most of the centers which practice labor analgesia follow this guideline we always it should be planned a peri anesthetic evaluation and preparation should be done history proper history physical examination and some investigation not every patient requires a platelet count right uh, before giving putting a epidural but in required patient we can get a platelet count like patient with derangement of lefties etc we can get a platelet count done and keep it as a record then fetal heart pattern fetal heart rate should always be uh, documented before giving epidural and after giving epidural <clears throat> so it everything should be documented a patient consent should always be taken always consent for aspiration to these patients remember clear oral intake clear fluid intake is a moderate amount is allowed to uncomplicated laboring women <clears throat> with women with additional risk factor little restrictions can be done and again i am saying it should be patient cultured it should be patient cultured solid food should not be allowed should be avoided in laboring patients then whenever you are practicing labor analgesia giving epidural giving drugs always keep the resuscitation trolley ready especially with 20% intralipid emulsion bag as a rescue therapy in case of any toxicity we had a case at our center and we managed successfully and we got it published also in igi i'll show you the <coughs> the screenshot of that study timing again repeating the same thing that we should not wait for some arbitrary cervical dilatation we should always give the female option if neuroaxial technique is available in our at the center and considering that in in a patient in patient with high risk right a uh, patient in high risk like obstetric like twin gestation or preeclampsia or anticipated difficult airway patient with high risk even before the she goes into labor we can secure an epidural catheter and get it confirmed that it is at right place right so timing should be again patient cultured we should not wait for the arbitrary cervical dilatation patient demand is enough for pursuing the uh, the labor analgesia putting the epidural catheter and in high risk patient it should put, it should be put even earlier okay <clears throat> then always patient control epidural analgesia is preferred continuous infusion is what is recommended and is what is being practiced at most of the center but as i talked little earlier programmed intermittent boluses have shown a very good result still it's a novel method and studies are going on concentration of your local anesthetic should be as less as possible right 
0.065 for BP Vicain would be good enough for maximum of the patients, right? But again, it should be patient cultured. Requirement of the patient varies. Then <clears throat> this is one research we conducted at our center where we compared the BP Vicain fentanyl combination with BP Vicain dexmedetomidine, other additive, and we found some excellent result. Analgesia was comparable in both the group. The only let's say significant difference what we got was the duration of analgesia with bupivacaine and dexmedetomidine group was much better then <clears throat> this was i was talking about the case report which we got published when we gave the epidural to one of our patients she developed some neurological complications which seemed like local anesthetic toxicity immediately we started uh, on high risk index of suspicion we started 20% drug pedi emulsion infusion and we managed the patient timely and got it published in Inter uh, Indian Journal of Anesthesia as well. So, what are the scope of few, uh, scope of research in this area? We need to validate the newer pain score in Indian population. Then, the role of ultrasound in uh, let's say putting a epidural catheter for liver analgesia. A lot of patients, a uh, high let's say um, uh, morbid morbidly obese patient, epidural the ultrasound can help, right? But Mostly these are young patients, even they are obese, you can easily put an uh, epidural catheter. But role of ultrasound can be can be studied, right? And there are a few studies on it. Then use of ultra low concentration of local anesthetic. We can go for even lower, lower, lower concentration, right? So <laughs> we can go that what is the lowest concentration which would give us adequate analgesia in these laboring patients. Okay. So these are the future research scope in this area. Right? So I hope this was helpful right to conduct labor analgesia at your center you should have a let's say fixed protocol and a protocolized practice would minimize any complication and give an excellent result thank you thank you swati Thank you so much. Uh, I think you'll have to put on my video, please. Uh, thanks, uh, Swati, for that extensive coverage um, and covering all the latest, which was so required for the students. And uh, thanks, both of you. Do we have any other, uh, any questions? I just saw one question in the chat box. And that was regarding the water injection, uh, Veena, that you talked about. Yes, ma'am. Actually, ma'am, uh, like uh, a small boluses of water injection is given in the back of the patient. It's more like a placebo therapy. Just it creates a pressure. And let's say a somewhat a pain relief has been shown in the females. No, I mean, not I said, <clears throat> just kind of placebo therapy for the, for yes, the patient. Yes, yes. But it has been published by Molana Zad people and uh, Dr. Kirti, I remember. So he did find good results. Yes, that's right. And, uh, uh, any other questions, organizers? Anything else in the chat box that you can see? No, ma'am. There are no more questions. Right. Uh, just one query that I had. Veena, do we, uh, do we get this 0.3 molar sodium citrate in India? Because we don't get it in Delhi. No, ma'am. No. Ma no. Ma'am, in India, yes, ma'am. In India, it is not readily available. But no, textbooks yeah. that they yes. are mentioning it. I know, I know. That I know. <laughs> and uh, Swati, this yes. question that you talked about would be a nice thing for the and a relief attitude questionnaire, pain relief attitude to put in the antenatal clinics, whoever have it with the obstetrician. So that will be also nice. Although I know that uh, labor analgesia uh, is still not that popular as it is in the western world but definitely these are good things especially for some sort of a thesis or something you could have some students going to the antenatal clinics and give this thing and you get some good data on it yes ma'am actually we are conducting a study at our center we are trying yeah. to validate this new questionnaire the angel uh, the angel questionnaire plus yeah. uh, we have a uh, like a, our person sitting in the gynae opd on uh, let's two days in the week and all the patients who oh. are coming for so we are getting uh, we are uh, also taking a history and uh, we are also encouraging the labor analgesia in them so we are conducting so that's great that's great that's good news 
Uh, so if there are no more questions, I think we need to go, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kaur and the whole of RML team and Veena and Swati for the excellent talks on the obstetrics. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much, ma'am. Thank you for your valuable time and contribution. Thanks to both the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. We could be a panel and chairperson here. We must not be being here now. So is here. <clears throat> Dr. Nathan? Yes, yes. Let's start with the next session. Yeah. So I would like to introduce the chairperson for the next section, uh, session, Dr. Samiksha Kanuja. Ma'am is Associate Professor at the Department of Anesthesiology in Hamdard Institute of Medical Sciences and Research at New Delhi. She has several achievements to her credit. She is a course coordinator for mechanical ventilation at Hamdard Institute. She is an organizing secretary of CMEs in 2018, 19, 20. She's an executive member of ISA Delhi from Hamdard Institute. She has been a faculty for various lectures and national conferences, is a life member of various uh, societies and has multiple publications to her credit. And her areas of keen interest are mechanical ventilation, pediatric anesthesia and pain management. We welcome you, ma'am. I hand over the proceedings of the session to you, ma'am. Ma'am, are you there? Uh, ma'am, you're mute. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you and so let's see you. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, you can continue with the session, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, the speakers, they're going, uh, we, are, we are going to have the, uh, the obstetric uh, emergency session first. Yes, yes. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, so we have the first session on obstetric emergencies. And uh, uh, Madam 
Dr. Nimphia Call will be talking about APH, PPH, and manual removal of placenta. Uh, Madam is uh, presently the specialist in head of department anesthesia and critical care in Sanjay Gandhi Memorial Hospital. She is the pioneer of DNB program in the uh, department, and she has uh, done a major expansion in the department. She's a member of Quality Assurance Committee of Northwest District NCT. She's awarded with the training of approximate 400 students in health assistance in affiliation with IP University.